So you are the urbanism editor at Curbed, mm -hmm. correct? Right. Yeah. And how long have you been in that position? I've been at Curbed for two, a little over two years. Oh, so not too long. Wait, almost three years? What? <laughs> Wait, this summer it would actually be three years, so two and a half years, yeah. <laughs> but you've been writing on urbanism and, and these kinds of issues for a very long, for a while? Yeah, before I was at Curbed, I was the urbanism editor at Gizmodo, so mm -hmm. this was a, a position that was created for me there. And before that, I was really just a freelancer forever. So it, gotcha. that was like my first real writing job when I was like 35. <laughs> and now you're 37. Yeah, no, no, not any older than that at all. <laughs> That's really interesting. So um, how long have you been in, in Los Angeles? I've been here, uh, this will be my 19th year. Wow. Oh, yeah, wow. my 19th anniversary. Your 19th anniversary. <laughs> And before then? Before that, I was in Atlanta. I was okay. used to be in advertising. This is why I have like multiple lives and careers. But I was uh, went to an advertising school called the Portfolio Center in Atlanta. Huh. And then before that, I was at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I before that, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. And when did you get into writing as a serious hobby or is it always a serious hobby and then it became I think like being in advertising I always knew I, I thought I wanted to be in advertising I think I knew I wanted to be a writer or a creative you might say um, since I was a little kid which is so weird like I liked advertising as a kid <laughs> and um, wanted to go found out about going to advertising school it, which was great about um, in at the University of Colorado in Boulder they have a really great ad school that is like part of the journalism school and since then they've restructured the program a lot so it's more about it's a journalism school that really has the coding and tech and production parts of it. So it's actually mm. quite a progressive um, journalism school now um, to include all these things. You know, in the last few years, all these conversations have been happening about what's happening with journalism. It's very incredible foresight, I think. Um, so when I was there, you got this very, you know, broad-based communications and um and and I would say like a creative enterprise approach to your journalism as well. Mm -hmm. So I knew I loved telling stories. I thought it was going to be in advertising, but once I actually worked in advertising, I did not like it at all because I think like working for the client was not exactly what I had in mind. And at the same time, you know, it was this dot com bubble was bursting where all these tech companies were paying for like advertising that was just banner ads and, you know, internet advertising right. what hadn't evolved into this like form yet, you know, right. where it's actually quite good sometimes. So um, I think I maybe just got into it the wrong time. There's mm. nothing wrong with advertising or being a creative, <laughs> but I realized I just love telling people's stories. And when I landed in LA, it was just going to be for maybe you know, getting some good freelance jobs or just sticking around for a summer because like New York and San Francisco really weren't an option based on what was happening in the economy and at the time. And then I just stayed and what I ended up doing was writing, pitching freelance stories about people and things that were interesting to me or that um, I found out about through my advertising and design connections. So it was people who were doing um, really cool like animation and illustration was going on the time product designers and then kind of merging into bigger stories about how design and architecture were impacting the city including how we change and move around our city so so I'm, I'm very curious because uh, we're, we're both uh, architecture trained in that background and I have uh, studies in urban design and that's an interest of mine um, <laughs> but how do you go from from advertising to being so interested, so heavily interested in urbanism, cities, and architecture, and things like this, to where you become an editor at Curbed? Um, was this were these things always interesting to you? I think or? so. I think what they what they don't really teach you when you go to be a journalist, or I'm just going to say I was a journalism school, is to actually write about things that are interesting to you. I think this idea that um, journalists cover like hard news and you have to have this really like broad based um, interest in just like you know issues that are facing you know people and you know, this general interest um, mm. approach to news gathering mm -hmm. um, 
I don't remember anyone ever really saying like, oh, you should write, you should have a beat that's like something that you actually like. I was just thinking of like the only beats that existed were like crime beat, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's all like you had in your head. But I don't think I really knew that like the field of criticism was such as, you know, mm. as big of an opportunity for someone who really was always interested in like art, design, architecture from when I was a very small kid as well. So I think just encouraging people who want to come up and and become a writer um, to just tell them to focus in so intently on what they actually are interested in. Right, right. I mean, that would be great if yeah. we could all get paid to actually write what we're interested <laughs> in. I got very lucky that I, at the time that I was writing about these issues, I think they you know, got pushed to the forefront of this conversation. Mm. So I was very you know, thrilled to be able to only write about mostly things that I actually did care about. <laughs> Well, I'd imagine also with the, the the rise of the internet and online writing that it would allow this kind of freedom, right? That you could write something that you, if you even if you have a really really niche interest, I don't know I don't know what that might be ducks and dogs, I right? Think, totally. There, there's probably some other weirdo out there who also right. has that interest. You had a blog, right, yeah, right. When right. I was starting, I wrote for um, this blog called Unbeige, which was owned by Media Bistro at the time. I think they've got bought and there's conglomerates and it's still out there but it's like owned by like advertising age or something which is a funny um, way of bringing it all around but uh, yeah I wrote for this design blog and it's true like everyone could start a blog to you know funnel their interest into uh, a, a form of content and that people could like back then I don't know you use your RSS reader to subscribe <laughs> to it be before even Twitter right um, and and it was it was that was a really fun time to be writing about design too because I think there were these design blogs that you would go on and you would engage in debate with you know other famous designers mm -hmm. at some time and so and everybody became like a, a critic in their own way of I love like the logo redesigns that would come out and everybody would like get mad about logo <laughs> redesigns. And those are like the best days when those <laughs> There's so much to feast on. Yeah, and that still happens actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I, that's, that's funny you bring that up specifically because it is very satisfying when you see it because it's, it's graphic and it's kind of easy to consume. Yeah, like, oh, yeah I, there's something I can talk about. Yeah, <laughs> everyone's an expert on yeah, brands, yeah, yeah, of exactly. course. It's like watching previews for a movie. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not going to see that movie. <laughs> um, so you've written a bunch of different things, and I'm somewhat familiar with your work, but the how in-depth you go with the articles is, to my eye, very impressive. Uh, and we were both wondering, so how much research has to take place before you write some of these articles? And I guess it varies with the article, but it seems like there's a lot of, I would imagine, a lot of time having to be spent before you can write anything down for it. Yeah. It, it varies. I mean, some pieces are very uh, deeply reported, and I'm spending, in some cases, a whole year gathering information. Not exclusively. I've been doing other things, but it takes about a year to do all the, explore all the avenues, I guess, that I need to explore for a story. And some stories you just whip together in a morning, like... Um, like I did this morning, uh, like opinion pieces or <laughs> more um, analysis of the news mm -hmm. where I don't necessarily have to talk to a whole bunch of people or experts. I just kind of aggregate other things that I see out there and, and put them together in a story with some opinion or some prescriptive <laughs> idea for uh, cities or, uh, you know, uh, design or you know, designers or something like that. So um, it just, it varies. And I'm lucky to work at a place where they really give us a lot of freedom and a lot of space to explore um, the topics that need to be explored in depth. Mm -hmm. And um, and we have an amazing team of all different people from all different backgrounds that are really um, very good at what they do and, and experts in their field. So apart from your the, the, the two educations that you mentioned, did, do you have any training or background in design or architecture or arts themselves? No, None. I'm just a fan. Just a, a, <laughs> a very, very serious fan. Because <laughs> I think some of the observations you make about city planning in general, I, I would agree with. And it's kind of, it's interesting to me because it, having met people who do have professional training in that or education, um, and yet they seem, in my view, to fall short of certain understandings of, of what the city should become. But you seem to be so so much in tune with uh, with what you feel like the city should should become. LA specifically, or cities in general, right? 
And this is just from walking around and having observations and talking to people. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. What I mean, was the magic that happened? That yeah, happened? I mean, I think like everybody, well, now is a little bit different in a lot of cities. Like you might feel like you could be heard, your voice might be heard, where in the past you would have to like go to a meeting and have two minutes to make your you know, state your case for how this building should change and then somebody votes on it and you might find out the the election. You know, it's just, right. but now there's so much more transparency about right. all these, these decisions being made at every level of government. So, um, and your elected officials do like read your stories and even your Instagram posts and you can right. engage with people pretty easily and you can organize with different advocates, for example, on places like Facebook. So, I think it's really, it's a different moment than it was even like 10 years ago. And writing mm -hmm. about these stories are very different too, because you used to have to go to the, meet the people where they were and go actually go to these neighborhoods and talk to people walking around. And who knows if you would talk to the, the people, the, you know, the most important people or the most critical people on the issue just by, you know, finding them. Yeah. Um, now it's, it's really like we can tell a lot of stories based on what, the chatter is, I guess, like the, the oh. online discourse. And then you do get to, you know, when you put your feet on the ground, you have a much more informed idea about um, who wants these changes, who doesn't want these changes, why are these changes good for only a certain group? And that's, these are the most fascinating stories that are being told about our cities right now. But so do you spend like a lot of time on all of the social media trying to kind of get an idea of how people feel about all of those? I think, well, I mean, then that's not really representative always as well. Like there's a lot of communities where there aren't as many people like using Twitter yeah, or, yeah, you know, on yeah, Facebook. Yeah. So, um, but I think like uh, to get a sense of what, to get, to get a bigger picture than what's in your own orbit, mm -hmm. that's where social media comes in very handy. Um, I wouldn't, I can't, I can't feel like 10 years ago I, I knew really anything that was going on at, with the city as a, in this holistic mm. way, right? I didn't yeah. know like much about how transportation, well, maybe barely, but like how transportation groups were organizing for, you know, better bus experience or um, safer streets, you know, all these things that are kind of, kind of bubbling up. But if you just walked around in a neighborhood, you would say, oh, well, all they're really doing is building the subway. You know, yeah. you would you would yeah. see like the bigger things and right. not like the smaller brush strokes that right, were contributing. Right, right. I mean, part of me wonders how difficult it is to to look at the the content on the social media platforms and get some kind of legible understanding of it because it's it can be very chaotic and and very wildly depending on people the kind of people who are contributing and but it's I guess it would make sense that there would be a, a, a significant place to to at least have some understanding of, of how people are thinking about their city yeah I think the biggest example is with housing issues particularly in the state of California right now there's all these bills like SB 50 which is wants to upzone um, certain parts of cities that are have transit hubs or have high frequency um, uh, bus and rail service and this is a perfect example of taking the temperature you know, from different cities and mm. different communities and different activist groups across the state on how they think this will impact their neighborhood. And it's very hard to go, you know, you can, again, walk to, you can walk around a place that might be impacted. You can look at, you know, compare building heights of, you know, say a five-story building compared to a two-story building and, and how people are saying that that will dramatically change their neighborhood and in some cases ruin their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really can, or, or slash the end of the world. There's yeah, 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 yeah. multiple. Ooh, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and that's, that's a really, that's a really amazing way to do you should, to, to, to tackle a story is to look at this, how this one little piece of legislation, which might, it doesn't really seem like a huge deal, but to some people it's, go, it's to them, it's like they're, it's going to so dramatically change their lives that they're doing everything they can to stop it for some very good reasons and some for maybe more frivolous reasons. Mm -hmm. So it, things like this, I don't even know. It changes the discourse, it, and it changes the reporting, but it also changes the way these bills are proposed, and it changes the way that even legislators have to, like, you know, talk about these things in the public realm, which is very, it's very interesting, it's very exciting. So when you, so when you write an article, do you try to kind of have a neutral presentation of the situation, 
or are you, you know, kind of saying like what side you're in? Do you have any rules or boundaries that you're trying to always respect when you when you write them? Some stories I just are I'm just writing a news story and I just straight up report it, just very, you know, cut and dried and and uh, offer try to offer opinions on both sides of it from people who are going to be impacted or, you know, part of the story. Um, a lot of what I write are opinion pieces or commentary or, um, you know, more like prescriptive ideas, I guess, like for, for cities based on what I see where I can put more of my advocate hat on. I think if you follow me on Twitter, looked at some of the things I wrote, it'd be very clear, like what I think about certain things. Um, but that's not always the right way to approach a story. Sometimes, some, if there's no, if there's no place for people to go get facts about mm. certain, mm. you know, new things that are being proposed, like legislation, um, sometimes we have to write those pieces first and make sure that we have something to, to link back to yeah. <laughs> later when we're having opinion pieces. So it's a, it's important to have a mix, and especially when some somebody comes out and like today, um, you know, Uber fi filed for its IPO and they or they <laughs> Uber um, had its IPO like its initial public offering, and I've written plenty of pieces about what that means or what it could mean or what it's going to mean about urban transportation and you know why we given so much of our cities over to this one company um, so I have like you know dozens of backlinks of all the different things that have happened with uber over the years um, but then I can offer some commentary too about why I think it's a good idea or a bad idea for us to be um, you know making this company it's gonna be what like the most valuable company in the world possibly and they're trying to co-opt our public transit in many ways. So. so on that specific topic, I'm very curious, um, because Uber has had its issues, which I think most people know, and I would have thought that some of those issues have been quite serious and that it would have affected them more greatly or diminished their ability to grow and have an impact or become influential, but it doesn't seem to be the case. No. Doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of companies I think are very good at uh, these larger companies are very good at damage control, and they sometimes hire firms to just work on uh, placing really positive stories about themselves mm -hmm. through a lot of the tech press who often just publish whatever they are told to publish. Mm. Um, won't name any specific names of blogs. <laughs> Nothing in the Vox Media universe, of course. We all have very high standards. We are, I mean, that's the great thing about working at Vox. I think like we are very investigative, very hard-hitting journalists across the board and um, from Recode to The Verge to Vox.com. You know, we have a really, and everyone, all the different curb sites, like we are very, we have a lot of integrity and it's it's really a, a proud, I'm so proud to work there. But I think especially with like, with these tech companies, and I don't want to be like, these tech companies, but with a lot of tech companies, um, we've allowed them to come very, become very powerful companies. And if even if you look at um, the whole Amazon HQ debacle that happened, <laughs> you know, a few uh, months ago, where they basically got kicked out of New York because people were too afraid about how they would impact the city, to the way that like. Apple's campus has been built um, in Cupertino, didn't have to really do anything to contribute to the housing problems there, and then mm -hmm. also had to build more space for parking than office space per A lot the, of parking, yeah, per which I think there. people forget about because there's a right. the big spaceship. Yeah, you're like the spaceship, that. there's like another spaceship just for yeah. car, <laughs> car storage. Um, but these are things where th these companies are making a huge impact on our urban environment. What It's not just like Uber that like runs cars yeah. that are zooming around our neighborhoods but it's also like the physical impact like Amazon's delivery footprint like think of how much yeah. that has Im impacted urban transportation so it's not just like the buildings themselves or the campuses or you know we're having too many people who are billionaires living in certain cities like San Francisco right now and maybe like buying up all the real estate and changing the market it's also just like how these companies are impacting how we get around day to day yeah, and and, day and what's on our streets yeah, yeah definitely definitely this is a total weird semi related thing but we were in Japan not too long ago and in Tokyo they have like three or four major uh, convenience store chains uh, there's 7-eleven which is one of them uh, Family Mart, H Mart, something, and what's really bizarre is that they, you can find one of those three on every single corner of every single street, and it's convenient, uh, and it's nice because everything's like the same price, but when we were walking through, we were thinking, 
I don't know, at least according to zoning, how this was allowed, but this radically changed how everyone in Tokyo or even other areas of Japan move throughout their everyday life. This has altered their lives for sure. And it's, it's strange when you think about that, that anecdote, but then also the, the te technologies impact Amazon, as you pointed out, or even going further, the smartphones that are with us all the time. And um, it does seem, it does feel like there's basically a handful of companies that are at the top kind of controlling or at the helm of, of all of this. Yeah, and you don't even know sometimes who's investing right. in who right. and which companies are, you know, back, like Lyft bought the bike share company Motivate and really? Lyft manages now, you know, City Bike and all these other major bike sharing operations, which we were never fully like public institutions, but you got the sense that they were like, working together with public transportation. Now they're owned by a company that, you know, companies like Uber and Lyft, and we, we don't really know their agenda. We know they want to help move people around cities. They say they want to do it in a more responsible mm -hmm. way. They're introducing bikes and scooters and all these other options. Um, but at the end, are, are these the companies that we want to be like basically you know, running our public transportation yeah, for designing us. the city, um, and I—that's I, a really good question. I've—I've I've always wondered with with these kinds of companies, um, it, amongst their staff and employees who make these big decisions, is there an urban designer or an urbanism writer, or an expert, an expert in that realm on that team? And if so, how much uh, voice do they give them? Because I would think it's incredibly important, based on the the urban researchers I've spoken with. Like, there's a, a huge body of knowledge there that happens from purely pure academics or from writers. And it's it's a scary thought to think that the companies who have the power and finances and, and to, to create something, which is amazing, but if they're not tapping into this other body of knowledge, then this is kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but what are your thoughts on the, I know you've written a lot about it, the automated uh, uh, vehicle and how it should happen, how it should yeah. be integrated in the city. I mean, that's been an interesting conversation just watching what Uber has done over the last year after they killed someone. Um, so the first death by, from a, like an, a vehicle that was operated by a company that was um, trying to test its autonomous technology on uh, streets by making, um, an actual driver drive it for very long periods of time and very late at night um, and in a way that they had disabled the car's ability to actually spot um, people and other non-car items in the roadway because that was slowing down their ability to um, iterate the technology this is all true um, really? yeah wow. so um, but but but, uh, but Tesla had issues as well I mean there's other companies that have Tesla had, is had... not an autonomous vehicle it's right. has driver assistance so, just like any you know any other like it's just like a more a little bit more uh, Semi-autonomous, is that what you would Well, I wouldn't even call that because once you start calling things like autopilot, right? You say that, you call it that. Um, then people think that they can go to sleep while yeah, they're right. in the car, yeah, right. which has happened. Um, and I think that it's an incredibly irresponsible way to market a technology that is, it's just like one step better than the driver assistance mm. uh, features that are on a lot of other vehicles. Like Volvo, for example, has really good similar features. They would never call it autopilot or say, take a break while you're driving. You know, it's all, it's meant to keep you more alert. I mean, Volvo is one of the companies too, which is saying that it's not only going to be like your car can monitor the road, but the car will monitor your eyes. And if you look away, the car will just, will warn you or stop or, and right. if you do it enough, it will not let you operate the right, car right, right, anymore, right. right? And that's kind of what we should have, I think mm. when it comes to to driving uh, and, and the way that cars are going to change. I mean, a lot of this autonomy talk is about how you can just press a button on your car and like take a nap on your way to work or yeah. work in your car. <laughs> yeah. um, but we just don't want a bunch of cars that are easier to drive 
coming in and out of cities and driving, you know, hundreds of miles to get people to work every day just because the humans themselves don't have to drive them. Hmm. So my vision for autonomy, which is actually kind of the other side of it, which is also happening in cities, you see these shuttle buses that are moving through cities now. They're going like 15 miles an hour, sometimes less. Mm -hmm. um, and they're on these dedicated routes. A lot of them are in places like college campuses or like on downtown streets, which, you know, have a lot of pedestrians. And it's a very efficient way to move people on predictable routes or slightly uh, routes that change slightly. Like there's on-demand shuttle services where you would go down and uh, use your app or a kiosk to say, I want this, you know, like the Dash bus, for example, in L.A. to come pick me up a little bit, a few blocks off of its normal right. path. And they just do these like circulator uh, routes through a city, getting people to the grocery store, taking the train station, you know, all these little trips that people might you call like an Uber or Lyft vehicle, but you could do it more efficiently if, right. if we were in these shuttle buses. So um, I like that idea of, of autonomy. I like the idea of giving people who have disabilities or are not able to drive a car. A lot of us are going to be getting older uh, very fast in the city of LA right now. And our, our population that's going to be over 65 is going to increase dramatically. So I like the idea of people not driving and, and going into these vehicles. But the real solution is fewer vehicles on road, period, and shifting people to different modes because we, we aren't going to be able to just give everybody an autonomous electric right. vehicle, and we absolutely should not <laughs> to yeah. not propose that or, or make that seem like that's something that is going to happen because it's really not going to happen. <laughs> because of congestion issues. Con congestion and also, like, climate goals. I mean, we mm -hmm. have a city that even if we, right now we have about, like, maybe 2% of our vehicles are electric, right, or that are driving around. That's probably maybe even generous. Um, fully electric. There's a lot of like hybrid vehicles, but those don't count because they still use fossil fuels. Um, and even if we increase that number, you know, by tenfold, we still have to reduce the miles that we drive because we just the the way that the the chart when you look at how how much we have to decrease our emissions by. Hopefully, in the next ten years, the city has a, a little bit more long ranging plan that I think is not quite aggressive enough to meet the goals, but mm -hmm. we still have to reduce the number of personal miles we are traveling every day in vehicles. So about half of our trips will need to shift to transit, walking, and biking. And right now, about 14% of our trips are taken walking, biking, wow. or on transit. So for the city of LA to even get close to what we need to get to, and that's not even enough, you know, that's like part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's all these other solutions that need to happen at the same time. So the thing you're talking about is is kind of a hybrid a mixing between classic public transportation and also these new technologies that are that most people f I think probably first think about as being embedded within the private vehicle. But you're kind of proposing well you're talking about something that's kind of a mixture of the two in a way, right? Yeah. <clears throat> because I mean if, I think for a lot of I don't know what we call them urban researchers et cetera, it's like why are we putting all this effort into this new, glamorous, interesting stuff, just make a good public transportation system and that'll, that'll be it. Because in terms of the sheer quantity of people that can be moved and efficiency in that way, which gets back to the question of uh, climate change and, and pollutants, like you know, New York City's MTA, for example, or subway, for example, like that's you're moving a lot of people mm -hmm. and very efficiently if you consider the, just the raw numbers. I mean, I have my beef with the MTA, but, but <laughs> from a first Everyone person does. experience, but, but right? Yeah, I think like the, the bigger like challenge to address is sharing rides, not automating or even electrifying rides. If we, and that's one place where you can maybe give companies like Uber and Lyft some credit because people aren't really carpooling of their own violation, but if you say, oh, hey, I'll offer you a cheaper price if you share a ride with four people right. in a Lyft and, I, and you get an even bigger incentive if we drop you off at a train or bus stop, um, that gives people some real reason to think about their transportation habits and how they're going to change throughout the day. So if we can get more people to share rides first right so that's that's the goal are they on a bus are they you know can they get to the bus easier are they sharing a bike with you know e-bike or that's like a dockless or scooter or whatever you got there'll be something like new on the streets next week and we won't even know what to call it um 
But if we can get people to share the vehicles, share the rides, um, and get people onto more of those modes where it is more efficient to move people, that's the real goal. And that's why we need to focus on how we design our streets to accommodate that. If it's a dedicated bike lane, a dedicated bus lane, wider sidewalks that make people want to actually walk instead of yeah. thinking they need to get in a car, um, you can help drive those decisions a little bit by what your city looks like. I, I mean, I agree with that. I don't think... Um, I think most people enjoy walking around. If it's a pleasant experience and they feel safe, then they're, it's fine to do. I don't think people have a, a predisposition to, to hate walking. I don't think that's, that's embedded within a person. I think it's more to do with the, the environment exactly. around Exactly, I agree. But it is important to, yeah, to think that if you, oh if you um, kind of push for the more individual transportation, then you're removing people from walking, and then you're changing the face of the streets and the architecture and the whole image of the city, right? <laughs> to the city. No, but seriously, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because you, you don't have to worry about those things anymore. You're just in your beautiful car from A to B. <laughs> the A to B thing is an interesting point, because I think, uh, I think in some ways, like a lot of the technology we have has allowed us to get from A to B easily, or we think it's going to allow us to do that. Um, it shortcuts, whether it be actual physical destinations or information, right? Google. I on, I'm only looking for the thing I want, and I find that specific thing. And I feel like this, this ability to do that has bled over into how we think about cities physically. So now there's, we could say there's a thirst for people to get from a, a exactly to B and nowhere else. Not a few blocks away, nothing else. I want to go exactly my destination. And, and I think some companies and people seem to be catering to that and seem to believe that that's a good way to design cities, as we're calling it. Um, but I, I'm kind of, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I like the idea that you had mentioned where you have this kind of shuttle system and it gets you close. But it's with yeah, you still business. gotta walk, and of course, the, you co of course you make all sorts of um, special exceptions and special places for people who have disabilities or sure. older or people with children is a big you know. Although I make my kids walk everywhere, <laughs> um, but you you know you make sure that those needs are taken care of for sure. But then yeah, look how much of our urban landscape here in LA is about this like wide like drop off type like the valet situation or the parking garages or you know curbs in front of places being co-opted by and you you see how being co-opted by private vehicles and you see how close people want to get by how they par they try to park somewhere, <laughs> right? So they're like, they go as close as they can to the actual entrance, and then they drive really slow, and then they go around the block, and then they think it might have a parking spot available, and then they like go really slow again. Yeah. And that kind of circling, that can contribute to a lot of you know, all the negative impacts of cars, like mm. not just congestion, but like at certain times of day, I think in downtown, there's some amazing statistic, but it's like, you know, 30% of the vehicles are like looking for parking or something like that, right? <laughs> They're like just circling. I don't the know if that's the exact number, but it seems real, right? Once yeah. you start to see how, because people just think they should be able to park for free yeah. or they should be able to get as close as possible to their destination. So like, why aren't we just routing people <laughs> directly to a parking garage with a spot they could pay for ahead of time and it would be priced fairly so they know when you, they know the the true cost of driving. When you f fire up your like Google or Waze app, it just tells you how many minutes it's going to take to get there. It doesn't tell you how much you're going to have to pay for parking, how long parking finding parking is going to take, and how you know. So it doesn't calculate all those other things. Whereas you use the trip planner on your phone to calculate a public transit trip and it gives you a price and you know it might take a little bit longer but you're only paying a dollar 75 and walking two blocks and you get there 15 minutes later that doesn't seem like that big of a deal yeah. um, compared to you know this you know endless cir circling of your your car trip and there are some cool projects especially happening here in LA with new developments where you know they're unbundling parking and building some homes and, um, uh, and building some apartment buildings that don't have this like two parking spaces per unit rule, which has been, it's actually like 2.5 in some places because wow. they they want you to have a spot for your guest when they <laughs> come over too. So it's this idea where we can like take apart the housing and the parking and if people want to pay for parking, that's great, but a lot of people don't want to and it drives up the cost of building housing and also, you know, using that housing. So it's great to see like a parking garage that can be, you know, 
adapted later when we won't need as many cars or there's like a drop off circle that can shrink as the mm -hmm. amount of cars, you know, are, are actually coming in and out to the space so that that those kind of like flexible spaces are what we need. Right. So I'm, I'm curious, though. So let's say if it is in this future that we're kind of painting, <laughs> why not? We'll just design it right now that we have these kind of shuttle buses and various modes of transportation. Um, would the city walking experience still, would it, would it be that much greater? Um, I'm kind of wondering, I'm kind of thinking like what else needs to happen in order for this, this street experience to, to feel pedestrian friendly? Or will see, still will people still feel like, man, this is not a nice place to walk for, for whatever reason? There are cities that are pioneering this new way of planning called like pedestrian first or walk first. So it's the idea that the best way to get everywhere that you're going is by walking and you'd be surprised once it's like a pleasant experience and you you know this but like people can walk like one or two miles you think about like when you go someplace like manhattan or that's not the best example maybe other european cities where they've actually pedestrianized like <laughs> our places like tokyo that like you're talking about where they pedestrianize huge right. parts of the yeah. city feels very welcoming you can walk for like two or three miles and you don't feel it. You're like, wow, I see interesting things. There's benches, there's trees, there's all these things that have completed this experience. And when you get to that street, you can tell that it was made for you. It was made for for walkers first, not just me as a walker, but like all walkers. So it's it's this way of just rethinking how you design the street. There was the complete streets movement, which was you know, in the last 10 years saying that like every mode is treated equally. So if you're walking, biking, taking a bus or riding in a car, you could, you all feel welcome on the street. Now there is an idea that we can even prioritize certain modes over other ones if we feel like it's the most you know, responsible thing for maybe a climate or congestion mm -hmm. perspective, health, public health perspective, right? These are all really important. So what LA needs to do is become a walk for city. And that's, right. that's the key is the best way for me to get from my house to downtown three miles away, really going to be walking, but maybe I'm not going to walk, you know, all three miles. But if it was, if I felt like there was a direct path, you know, a pedestrian path that maybe cut through the city the way the freeways do, right. uh, and I could jump on a bike or not, or take a bus for some of it, you know, that we call those walk extenders, right? A bus or a, <laughs> bus or a bike, you know, they're, they help you like walk, you're still walking at the beginning and the end of the trip, but in the middle you right. do this little like hyperloop thing. So um, th this is like a really great way to think about how we get it around. Like, is your first impulse to go get in the car or do you just start by walking right. and see how far you get? So are the scooters uh, counting as walking? <laughs> I think, well, that's, you know, that's the whole big question about the scooters, which I think is just so funny. Like, the, the average trip is, you know, between one and two miles, like a very short trip on these vehicles. And everybody is so mad about this because they're like, oh, they're replacing walking. Well, first of all, so what? At least they're not in a yeah. car. But also, um, that tells you a lot about why people aren't walking. If you can get on a scooter and you can go faster, maybe it, you, it was too hot for you to walk or maybe like there wasn't a pleasant place for you to stand in the shade or, or the, those sidewalk was so um, upheaved yeah. with tree roots that you you know didn't feel like you were welcome there so mm -hmm. if you can jump on a scooter and get somewhere in five minutes where it took you like a very unpleasant 25 minute walk that's great like yeah. I, I think we should accommodate for that also you have to walk to get the scooter usually it's and not usually you're still burning calories, yeah you're you know, still like right? moving yeah. around yeah it's not like a scooter is always just like right in front of you. it seems that way in certain parts of the city but there's not, it's not always right there in front yeah. of you yeah 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 i mean it's an interesting question for los angeles i mean you mentioned new york we both lived in new york city for a number of years and and know it pretty well um, and it's a place where you feel comfortable walking because that's that's that is the culture there despite you know there's still a lot of vehicles and and uh, Manhattan Too many, specifically. Yes. Yeah, a lot of vehicles, <laughs> uh, 30% of public space is just asphalt. But um, but but from a first person experience uh, perspective, uh, New York kind of caters to the walker because uh, it's visually impressive to see. And the question that I would have for Los Angeles is that even if we do, even if people uh, feel safe walking, is it going to be enough? To, to create uh, the correct scene for people to, to, to encourage them to walk. Because LA, 
for my eyes, is not the most beautiful city. And there's a lot of really weird, you know, vacant space under freeway, kind of these weird negative mm -hmm. void spaces. And you have to wonder, like, what has to happen with those those spaces and the freeway infrastructures and stuff like that to create this this uh, environment that, that encourages walking. Yeah. Right. There's really good examples of how a lot of cities have reclaimed the space in and around freeways in you know, freeway cat parks and all these other interesting developments where um, you can re-knit those neighborhoods mm. back together and, and fix a lot of the problems. I just am not seeing that is seemingly a priority, and that would be a state thing because it's Caltrans. It's not really the greatest like secret about you know LA and and learning about freeways is that the city really has no jurisdiction whatsoever around these freeways that slice <coughs> through our city in all these horrible ways and create all these very um, negative impacts on the, its residents. Um, and they really can't do anything about it. So that first thing I would say is Caltrans should take all the money that it has and um, start rehabilitating those spaces. Like can, there's a really good example in Hollywood where, um, where they've been talking about things like freeway cat parks. Those are very expensive, and like what Boston has done, where they like kind of buried their freeways, covered them with parks, the big <laughs> dig, and they're you know gave back that space to these neighborhoods. It's very successful. They did an amazing job. You have to travel, you know, in a tunnel for some of it, which scares people in LA. Although tunnels are fine and very safe, but uh, safer than like you know other uh, overpasses, which tend to break in, in earthquakes. But we have to think about like, can we start to just take a little bit of that space back? And there's a little tiny park in Hollywood next to the 101. It's on like Franklin and like Coenga, right? So it's you might not notice it even if you were using the freeway, but they just kind of carved out a little public space where it was kind of a freeway overpass and like a, one of those forgotten spaces. And yes, it's close to the freeway, which hopefully soon will not be as big of a health risk or a noise risk because we'll have quieter, somewhat you know, healthier electric vehicles. But just starting to take some of that space and away from the freeway and give it back to the people. And there's cool concepts for you know underpasses or um, better overpasses, <laughs> but we haven't really done a very good job. Like Santa Monica's newest park in downtown by the 10, right? So like they, there is like a little spot where you go through a tunnel as a 10 turns into the, the 101. And they did kind of cap that with a park and put in some water features and things. So you can now walk kind of uninterrupted from the neighborhoods to the ocean. Um, but that that's like one, only one, you know, there aren't very many good examples in Southern California. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting uh, question. And, you know, the one thing about new New Yorkers that we found that was quite fascinating is that uh, they are willing to, they're kind of, they're pretty resilient, uh, meaning they're willing to put up with what would appear to be a very crappy space if it's going to be used for some reason. So. Pocket park, pocket park, or an art space, or whatever, or a pizza joint that's really good. It's a really bad neighborhood. People will still go there, and I used to think that it was a, a New York thing, which I believe it is. But maybe it's also just a people living in cities thing, and that people are willing to put up with the the less um, aesthetically pleasing uh, aspects of a space if it's going to give something back. And also, I think the the, the first people to visit these. These kinds of spaces that we're talking about will be the probably the weirdos of the group and the ones that are are interested in pushing this conversation. So they will be there not just for themselves, but to kind of partake in, in a movement in a way. That's my hope, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, no. big hopes right there. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, but house, housing in Los Angeles seems to be a big issue, and you, and you brought it up a little bit, right, with the densification of certain neighborhoods. Um, and I know the ADUs have, have been a, become a very big and successful thing, from what it, can, it sounds like. But does the, is the broader solution to that that we will have to just densify, and the single family, single story, or two story house structures will have to become three, four, five? I don't think anything needs to be technically knocked down or that's the big question about SB 50 right so it's like the people who oppose it are like your house will be replaced by an eight story building whether you let one in or not you know that's like their big their big messaging 
And while I think we should um, certainly upzone certain neighborhoods, especially ones around transit, you know, places where building subways and light rail lines, um, we're still building, building a lot of them, but these these went in 10, 20 years ago, and nobody went to the neighborhoods around there and said, maybe we should change the rules here a little bit. And you, you can go to some of these stops, like I was at the Expo Line, um, the Westwood uh, station of the Expo Line. I don't, it's, not, it's just Westwood. It's like south of the actual neighborhood of Westwood, but it's like uh, you know at the street Westwood. And it's all single-family homes for, I don't know, a, a great deal. It's like at least a 20-minute walk around. It's probably all zoned for single-family homes. Mm. And that just seems ridiculous. <laughs> and they also want, like, parking spaces so they can drive to the train, like, because they don't want to walk or it's not friendly to walk. So you've got this really serious problem that we have, and how are we going to fix it? ADUs are great because, and they, yes, the permitting, once they like loosen the rules about how you could permit one and you know streamlining all these processes, the applications skyrocketed. Do we know if all those people are going to use them to house people? We're not even sure. Do we yeah. know, you know, there's other plans that the county and the city are proposing where you could house someone who was formerly homeless or you could, you know, get some kind of incentive if you're actually going to contribute to the solution. Right. Some people might just be building, you know, backyard yoga studios and you're just, <laughs> they're getting like, you know, the streamlined permit, which is fine, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think that like stealth density, this idea that we can like fit more into these blocks where it doesn't have this like fear of this five or eight story building. It's usually like five stories starts to scare people a lot. Mm -hmm. There's like in these stories, uh, in these, uh, you know, tales of like mm -hmm. what's happening out there. Um, so I think like the idea that we can, you know, take a sing single family neighborhood and it's not like these people are going to, you know, have their lives radically upended by a, a four unit building, mm -hmm. which is another part of SB 50, which is that we would make like, you know, a fourplex by right in most places around the state. It's not like your life is going to change that much if there's four families living next to you instead of one family. People might tell you that, but there you look, you go around LA and see how many of these beautiful apartment buildings, bungalow courts, um, like a four or eight plex, these like beautiful, like Spanish style, you know, from the 1920s apartments. And those are part of the LA fabric. You think, you know, yes, half of our developable, la developable land is zoned for single family housing, which makes huge parts of the city the only thing that you'll see in other, in other cities around us too. But then you look at places like, you know, where I live um, in a neighborhood that was, it's very dense. Like Koreatown and, and Westlake, like those are some of the densest neighborhoods uh, west of the Mississippi. And I would say like west of, you know, New York City. Mm -hmm. It's like incredibly dense. And a lot of people living in these neighborhoods. And it's not all high rises. It's like these 12 unit, eight unit, six unit apartment buildings that people think of when they think of LA and they're like, oh, that's such a beautiful, amazing building. Oh, but a five story building next to my house that's new. No, 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 no. That should be hor So maybe we should just be designing all the new buildings as like these, you know, knockoffs of these Spanish style apartments from the 1920s. So you just don't even know. I feel like you wouldn't know maybe. I mean, I think there is something about uh, the density of people in a single lot and it, it changes one's uh, uh, perception of, of how um, like autonomous they, they are. I mean, if you live in a giant apartment tower that's three stories, that's like one thing. Single family is another. And maybe five stories, I, mean, I don't have an issue with five stories, but, but maybe five stories is, is at that threshold for a lot of people. But I would agree that if you're three to four families in one building, if the building is done well, it's not it's not going to affect you. But yeah. if, if you get up to like maybe eight families, then it starts to become kind of a different beast. Well, everybody worries there. about parking, right? Because they're well, like, oh, where are we going to put all these cars, these people, true, these drugs? But then you go to these neighborhoods where they 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 are zoned for single family housing only, but they don't have like a historic overlay protection. So <laughs> it means that you can knock down the house and you can build like a bigger house, like a McMansion type thing on your, or McModern, all these different terms. You can build a bigger house. So you go to these neighborhoods and you're like, great, that's so cool that you knocked down a house and built a bigger house and you, it's still just for you. And then like, but the neighbors don't seem to be upset about 
that ruining yeah. the character of their street, or maybe they are, but they're you know that's a that's some like the worst offender compared to uh, adding you know maybe two families to that yeah, right, gigantic right. thing they bought because of the parking parcel. Right? <laughs> do you think it, Do you think it has to do too with you know maybe the the category of people that a five story multifamily building would bring into a single family residential neighborhood? Demographics. Yeah, I mean the the yeah. thing about that though is. If a new, like, three-plex went into a neighborhood that did allow it, the cost of that to rent or buy immediately just goes up to the yeah. same level as a single-family yeah. home. Because if sure. it's in a desirable neighborhood, yeah. it's not unless there's some kind of restrictions or inclusionary housing things, which are normally applied to larger buildings. And there's we have this thing called our Transit-Oriented Communities Guidelines, where if you are close to a bus. It's kind of like what SB 50 wants to do in a little bit more limited way in LA, but if you build close enough to a rail or bus stop, you can add a few more units if you want to as long as they're um, zone as long as they're available for low income families. So yeah, that would be ideal. It'd be great if that's what was happening. But instead, what is happening is like this house sells for a million dollars, and the other side it's a million dollars, and then a threeplex goes in, and they're all a million dollars for each of them. It doesn't work out that way, right? <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, why not? Um, <laughs> and that's why developers will want to buy your house, even if you know if you if you think your single family neighborhood is going to be ruined when it gets upzoned, you can sell it for. A lot of money, so a developer can knock down yeah. your house and build that tower, but you can move somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I did want to go back, I know we're jumping around, but uh, to the question of transportation, which is totally not what we're talking about at the moment. But um, I have to ask so Elon Musk is a person that's, and I talk about him too much, I talk about him way too much, but he's a person that fascinates me because of who he is and also his proposals. What are your thoughts about his? Um, I forgot what it's Hyper called. Loop? No, no, it's not Hyperloop. Hyperloop is a more regional scale thing. The underground tunnel, whatever. I think that's just Loop. It's just yeah. Loop? <laughs> well, is it called Loop? Well, yeah, the one they proposed for Dodger Stadium is called, like, they would call it, like, the dugout loop. So it's, like, Loop. So I think it's, okay. like, the Hyperloop is fast loop, and then Loop is, like, the slow, yeah, right. the local. Yeah. The Loop is the one that's, it's the one where he did a, a mock-up tunnel not too long ago, mm. right? That's the one you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, that, well, we don't, we don't really know what the, what, it even really is. I know he dug a tunnel, which I saw, and I got to go to that, the reveal of the oh, really? car driving oh. through the tunnel. Um, so I don't think the transportation system is actually going to be Tesla's for passenger Teslas oh. driving through tunnels. He, They have said at the Boring Company that they're going to make these they look like buses or yeah. you know little train cars. Um, for the Dodger Stadium project in particular, they had this mock-up of these like vehicles that might go, you know, uh, travel one mile or one two miles, <laughs> a very short distance that would be very bikeable or perhaps yeah. walkable, definitely bussable, um, and get people underground to uh, places like uh, they've said things like LAX. They said they want to build this whole system underground, but. Um, one of the places is like downtown to LAX, which actually might work sure. because you do want to get there pretty fast and it's like a known destination. Yeah, like it's that's a, a very yeah. specific, specific right. like one thing. And that's what they said they're building in Chicago to get to O'Hare, mm -hmm. even though there is a train that goes to O'Hare. <laughs> um, but this idea that you can get right to the airport um, with your luggage without a car underground. So. That might be a good use case, um, but we don't know many details. I mean, really? they dug a tunnel. They dug a tunnel um, at the same rate as Metro digs its tunnels. Maybe faster, but we can't get a clear. We can't get a clear the breakdown on specifics or costs or things like that. And then we know that they've done something interesting with the dirt, which is always a big problem when you're digging tunnels, right? They just use a regular tunnel boring machine, the same one that anybody uses off the shelf. It's not. It's actually a used one that used to dig sewers up in the Bay Area. Um, so that's not. There's not much innovation there. But they, we know that they've taken the dirt and made it into bricks. Hmm. So when you went to the opening of the boring um, company tunnel, there was this tower they had built with these bricks on site. That's maybe one innovation that's pretty interesting. Interesting. 
Um, whether you could use that for whatever reason. Uh, but this idea that we could be tunneling a lot faster or um, saving a lot of money or opening these projects quicker is a very enticing one. And that would be great if they that is the problem they're solving. But we really don't know if, you know, that we don't have a transit system mm-hmm. mock up. We have a tunnel, right. which I right. think they're continuing to build. Um, we have a car elevator, which isn't really. Um, that's not an efficient way to move people up and down through I these think so. spaces. <laughs> Elevators are the are holding us back in many ways, you know, in, in our aspirations. Um, so we we don't really know what this will entail yet. Huh. But and I think dig, digging a, a hole to Dodger Stadium um, just seems like a perfect example of spending a lot of money to maybe solve a yeah. non problem right. when we could widen. Uh, the bike lanes or something. You know, we have this great dedicated bus lane that goes from Union Station to Dodger Stadium on game ga- on game days. Um, that's free if you have a ticket, and it's a it's our best example of how dedicated bus lanes actually work. <laughs> because if you actually set aside a lane for buses to drive in, oh wow, amazing! Like they get there, they get to. <laughs> so why not do that from all the red line stations? You know, like that's so easy. Everyone could just get to Dodger Stadium really quickly. So what's the holdup? Do you think? I know this is a huge, huge question, but um, you know, what, what, what's the preventing factor from uh, having more dedicated bus lines or to any of these things? Space? Is it, yeah, uh, people being too worried that they would inconvenience a driver. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of cities, they've tested this idea of a pop-up bus lane for a few months, and they say, oh, it's, you know, it's, just for, it's just a test. And then everybody starts to see how efficient it actually is on the bus, when, you, when you're sitting in traffic and you see that bus going by you, that's a powerful tool, right? If you're, it's, right. it's usually not like that in LA. You're in the same traffic as you know, every, everyone around you is, is suffering in the same way. But if, I think if you're sitting in the other countries, of course, that have done this to a great scale, and a good example is like in Colombia, where I, I got to go to Bogota a few months ago, and they had their dedicated buses basically running down the middle of the freeways at these very huge um, walkable stations, you know, punctuating their freeways. And there's no reason why we really, not that we should be moving all of our transportation in the middle of the freeways, a very dangerous, loud, and horrible place to experience. <clears throat> right. But, um, this idea that you could just start to slowly take those lanes and say, these are for buses, they're going to get priority, and they're going to get people where they're going faster. So we could try something like that where we did some pop-up bus lanes. Hmm. The mayor's office has said they're interested in doing that. But I think what you see with the few dedicated bus lanes that we do have, like on Wilshire, like I rode the 720 last night, and the bus lane is dedicated for a while, and then Beverly Hills didn't want it. So on that, when you go through Beverly Hills, it's not dedicated. <laughs> Um, it's, Beverly Hills is you know, very yeah. opinionated, I would say, yeah. and influential for Right. Whatever. So we have this fractured city. That's one issue. But I think also just like how do you convince people that it's going to be better unless we actually try it, unless yeah. you actually can see the benefit? What about the subway system in LA? We haven't you know, experienced it, um, <laughs> mostly because we heard a lot of bad things about it, like safety-wise, and, and the network is not apparently very good. Is that something that you see is slowly evolving to a better type of transportation? I mean, they're building it more, so it's go, it goes to more places. But if you don't live in a place where you can use it, um, or if you can't afford to live in a place where you can use it, it isn't much use to you. And uh, the way that they're expanding it in a lot of parts of the city and county, really, um, are going way out. Like, the gold line is going, like, way, way out east to these cities um, that will just have, you know, commuters that should be able to get to LA, but they also aren't really focusing as much on the neighborhoods that are super transit dependent. So like, mm. in you know, again, going back to my neighborhood, we've got the red line, which you can, you know, I took a part of the way here and then, you know, took a car the rest of the way, um, the, took a, a ride share the rest of the way. So like you can use that for part of your trip, but then you're still going to be first mile, last mile solution for a lot of people might not live close enough to a bus or like here, I didn't even, it probably would have taken me another hour to get here from the North Hollywood um, red line stop if I had just taken buses. Um, But then like focusing like on improving those connections within the city where most people are, are getting around without cars. So like you look at somewhere like Vermont, which is, a you know, has the red line, has the purple line, has like, you know, the expo line, all kind of crossing. But then to go from 
my neighborhood to like South LA, I have to go all the way downtown and then go all the way back out on the expo line, you know, and there's no, there's a bus, but it's not a dedicated bus. So figuring out how we can complete that wheel, you know, it looks like this, there's like little like spokes coming out of all the different colors mm -hmm. is, is part of this, the problem. Um, it, for our rail transit, it, you have to kind of go out of your way to get a lot of places. And the regional connector is going to be great when it's finished next year because that's like some new right of ways they're digging through downtown. Like all of downtown is torn up right now. So you won't have to make multiple transfers to get from those, the gold line to say the blue line, expo line, uh, all these different parts of the, the system. So that's a good example of solving a very big problem and making it more effective for yeah. people to use it that will shave time off people's commutes and help people make connections on their trains i mean that's that's a a no-brainer some of the bigger things like sepulveda how do we get people over where the 405 over the sepulveda pass is now i mean how can we just do that as fast as possible mm -hmm. that's probably can be a bus for now and mm -hmm. you know this dedicated bus lane on the 405 which they they have something like that but more, you know, right, 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 right. we we spent all this money widening it, and they realize that travel times actually haven't improved and may have gotten worse now. So we've spent like a billion dollars to create more traffic on the four hundred five. Well, from what I understand, with these giant freeway freeway projects, is that they take so long because they're huge that by the time they're finished, the traffic catches up or yep. surpasses. Yeah, them. you see a new it's freeway crazy. lane there, you're gonna just drive in it, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's, it strikes me in your description that the, the solving these issues or addressing these issues in Los Angeles is even more difficult because of the, the landscape of it and from a kind of urban planning perspective, like the complexity and the, the, the patchwork and wildness of it. Like Manhattan's a nice clean grid. <laughs> this way we could really concede. Flat. It's flat, yeah. more or less, yeah. right? But LA, you know, that's the Yeah, we have a mountain range challenge. running through our city. It's cool, yeah. <laughs> So do you think that in the in the you know more near future that the first mile last mile issue um, that like scooters and these alternative modes of transportation would are they probably the best best bet? I think there's there's a mix. It depends on the topography is a big challenge. I mean, oh. if you <clears throat> bought a house up in the hills and you wanted to try to not get around in a car. Um, how are you going to get up that hill at the end of the day? I mean, even the e-bikes don't go. It's it's right. they don't go that fast. It's kind of hard. Um, I've struggled on on quite a few of them. <laughs> um, but there are, you know, this is where something like the micro transit solution, like those autonomous buses. Not that we would necessarily want autonomous buses on all those little canyon roads, but maybe they'd be human driven buses. But there are these in other countries too, where um, you know these shuttle buses go around and collect people and deposit them at the <laughs> at the train station, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, you can get a ride up the hill um you could maybe walk down but then you could get up but this is also like where i come back to the the sidewalk infrastructure a lot of these places mm. you don't feel safe walking if you're on like a super narrow canyon road for example but there's also parts of there's parts of the city all over where there are literally stretches with no sidewalks in in any neighborhood you could go and find a few that just have nobody ever put them there? They were in a lot of places in like South LA and Watts and some of these cities. They're you know within like the you know encompassed all around <laughs> um, where, where LA like is around them. All you can go into these cities where they don't still have money for sidewalks. So they haven't prioritized the, the sidewalks, trees, benches, all these you know small oh, yeah. parts of the infrastructure. So a first mile, last mile solution might be very easy in a place like Santa Monica where they prioritize getting around on foot or bike. And then you go to certain other places where you try to get to the train and, you know, looking at like how the Crenshaw line is going into neighborhoods where nobody's made sure that it's safer for biking. But a lot of people get around on bikes and that's the only way they get around. Right. So if we're not making it safe for people to do these things, how, we can't expect them to want to, you yeah. know, ride a bike or walk to get to these places. Yeah, that's only fair. You know, I, this is a dumb idea. But maybe everyone should go to New York City and live there for like six months and then come back. Because I think there is there is are, are major advantages to the scenario we're describing. And I think one of them is a greater sense of community. And that's something that for us coming from the East Coast has been uh, a bit of an adjustment. Because uh, we, you know, we have a car, so we go from my house to the studio in the car. and. Um, one of the questions we're always asking is like, well, like we still don't really know LA apart from the very specific destinations that we go to. And there is something magical about being at, a, at, a, at a, an entire city or at one island 
in the case of Manhattan, where people walk around, it's because you have a very strong sense of the built environment, but also the people, the community. Mm -hmm. There's like the greater understanding of public in, in that way, and citizenship. And but that comes back to the type of high, the type of housing. The type of housing. Yeah, if you live in your own home, why would you even bother socializing with people around yeah, you? You don't have to. Yeah, that's just true. Right. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That's, I guess like that's you're true. transient. You rent an apartment here. You move there. You get to know people. You know who lives upstairs next mm -hmm. to you. You know, like you have to kind of merge with your neighborhood. A bit. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think that that appeal is something that most people would like, aside from the. Uh, I don't know, those, those who like to live in a complete isolation. Um, <clears throat> but you were mentioning uh, Dodger Stadium, and it's, it's not really related, but the development that the city has to undergo for the Olympics is another big question uh, for 2028, yeah. correct, right? And from our, our cursory knowledge of it, that the strategy, strategy seems to be instead of building a, a bunch of brand new stuff to kind of use what's already existing, right? And I feel like historically um, that's often not the case and that the Olympic Games, I think, simultaneously allow cities to elevate themselves according to like a much larger perception of the city, but destroy what was there uh, before the Games. And, um, but it seems like maybe the development this time is, is, not, is trying to, to not do that. That's what they say. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, the reason that they picked L.A. and they're really um, reforming the rules for Olympic host cities now and I think trying to take a lot of the pressure off of cities for having to do this empire building, basically what they have to do every single time. And then, yeah, they are the stadiums end up abandoned and neighborhoods were knocked down for, you know, projects that never are, aren't used or didn't come to fruition. So I think there's... Cautionary tales, for sure, and we hopefully have learned from them. L.A. has not only hosted the Olympics once, um, but they've done it twice. And both times that they did it, they said 32 and 84. Both times it was sold on this idea that, like, we have all this amazing infrastructure. We're going to make it very profitable um, for our, the residents and people who live here. But there were also a lot of... Um, things that happen during both of those Olympics that I think uh, have, are giving people a pause when it comes to um, trying to lure the Olympics back here again. And with a lot of the other issues that we're facing right now when it comes to housing, transportation, are these things going to get fixed or are they going to get band-aided, you know, by the time <laughs> that the Olympics open? So we're, we're less than 10 years out now, right? Where it's like it's coming and it's happening and or some people are trying to stop it still. But I think I, I have a feeling that um, I, the, this has become such a, a moment of pride for a lot of the city leaders. They, they really want to, like, show this L.A. off to the world. Um, I don't know how we are going to get past this, like, civic, you know, manifest destiny type situation we have going on so it's very hard and I see like the arguments there's groups that are trying to organize um, to get the city to address some of these issues like what are we going to do um, to make sure that the city isn't going to uh, fall into massive debt after the games like how do we ensure it's a success like mm -hmm. what are we we do we are going to have to build something we are going to have to fix how we get around we are going to have to address security and policing you know a lot very, very big issues. And um, the, the city hasn't provided so many great answers to this, but they gave us like a, a budget the other day. It's like $6.9 billion, but like we get some of that back or something. You know, it's like these numbers mm -hmm. we're talking about in hypotheticals. You know, we don't really mm -hmm. know really what's going to happen. There's a lot of uncertainty. So can we do it in a way where if we do have to build anything or transform anything, um, it serves the communities? that are already there and make sure that they're when they the games leave it's better than they found it and even you know we're saying we're not building anything but we are actually building a lot of stadiums right now and facilities that are not necessarily for the Olympics, right. but they've kind of been yeah. sold that way. And especially things like you know, the stadium in Inglewood, which has already caused a lot of problems um, with people who have lived there for a long time. They're saying that their rents are getting driven up and their you know tenants are being displaced and all these other problems because people are seeing you know dollar signs in their eyes as they're looking at this stadium. And then there's things like hotels. They keep saying, 
we have a hotel shortage. We're going to need places for people to stay in the city. And so we are giving tremendously large tax breaks to these hotels mm -hmm. um, to build, you know, how large structures that are not going to be used as housing, you know. Yeah. So there's an idea, there's all these ideas floating around for um, how we we are going to need to shape the city just for the games, even if we're saying we're not building anything, we actually are building quite a few I things. Would, I would imagine, <laughs> yeah, under the guise of other things. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think you have to build stuff. I, I, I feel like it's finding that overlap that you described between what LA needs anyway and how much of it can overlap with the games mm -hmm. and looking for that overlap and maybe even uh, consciously trying to create that overlap seems like the best strategy um, and stadiums are are a really bizarre thing anyway because I think from what I know most of the times when they get dropped into whatever neighborhood um, there are the issues of uh, prices going up and things like this, but also it's like this has this is a foreign object. It has nothing really to do with the the local community. Local is mm -hmm. kind of a charged word, but the local community that's there, because also sports stadiums, if they're specific to a team or whatever, it's, it's a brand. It's, like, it's very it's the, the 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 difference between global and local is hyper highlighted yep. in the stadium being dropped in, and I and it's it's a more of a, a qualitative kind of discussion but I feel like it's one that's super important and it's 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 always it's always perplexed me and I, I've never really heard a, heard a good argument uh, stating why having a stadium in this neighborhood is now a really good idea yeah like, is it though yeah like do you ask the people that live next to it <laughs> yeah. you know they're not gonna I don't know it's 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 very bizarre especially because the program around the stadiums are always packed in with you know, wiener snitchel or whatever, or whatever. Parking. They always or, want to try to put. Even parking. in like downtown, when they were proposing putting a football stadium downtown, it was like, well, where are people going to tailgate and how are they going to get there? And I was like, it's by like several major like train <laughs> facilities. <laughs> and I think you could find if you gave them a park, people could tailgate in a park yeah. without a car. Like it wouldn't be that hard to do. <laughs> it's like this, you know, just like the mind shift of like, oh, oh, we could. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's an odd thing. And it, it always reminds me of the Barclays Center in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and how that was all developed. And specifically, uh, you know, they hired, Frank, I think, Frank Gehry for a bit of time. Uh, to, yeah, do the planning, but there's a lot of suspicion that that was ne he was never really going to do it. They just hired him to yeah. get, get the press, right. and then just like the LA River. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think he's actually doing that. Is he? And so uh, that actually is an interesting thing because uh, when I first heard about that uh, that project and Gary was heading it up, and my my first thought is, well, I don't know Gary as a planner. I know him as the Bill Bow and concert hall person. Is he and his firm qualified to do like city scale? <laughs> No, it's seriously city scale planning because that's not his his uh, supposed expertise, from what I can tell. So, yeah, if that goes through, I'd be very curious to see to see what happens. Um, but anyway, so like uh, with the with the Barclays Center, that they would bring on like Jay Z to as a, as a front man to to hype up the stadium, and and I don't know, there's the tension between the city officials and feeling the need to again elevate their city to like this new level that they can be proud of and that the global scale and that the the discord between that and the people that are living in the one story houses there's that new stadium over by USC. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, the soccer stadium. This is a yeah, soccer stadium, yeah, right? And yeah. I was driving around there because I was lost. <laughs> and there's a number of neighborhoods. There's like a strip of houses that's smack between the freeway and the stadium. And it's the most bizarre, like dystopian street I that you'd never bid on, right? But this is like the reality of of the urban fabric in this place is that stadium, freeway, and this like one strip of after two maybe two blocks of houses. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how we contend with these things is a, is a question. Yeah, and I I think the the thing about too about the river going back because it is kind of part of this Olympic plan too, right? Mm -hmm. The Olympics are meant to activate parts of the river that are going to be used for like kayaking or I don't know what else, tons of different things. Um, and some, I think uh, there, that is one of the places where they want to build like athlete housing or, you know, things like that where, you know, as part of developing the river. The river is like this giant development corridor just waiting to happen right through the middle of the city. And you're starting to see some places where there is housing being built, but it was a place that was like a freeway. It wasn't a place that anybody wanted to live for a really mm -hmm. long time. And now 
if you're going to clean it up and make it um, like usable and swimmable. Like I've kayaked in it, which is super fun. Um, there's all this great opportunity to actually create more public space and more green space for neighborhoods. So how are you going to do that? And I think the Frank Gehry thing is interesting because it's it's he's kind of like the Jay Z of this project where <laughs> they're bringing him in to get these donors and get interest in some of these places. But you're right, is it going to be punctuated by like 20 Disney halls and they're all like going to look a little bit different and just be these like follies on the river like all up and down uh-huh. or are we going to have you know he has brought on like hydrologists and and people who are going to study like you know the way that the different creeks and different neighborhoods could maybe be like daylighted so you would in your neighborhood see how like the typography in the canyon used to go down to the river and you could f- you know trace those with better trails and paths and you know parks along the way and so that's kind of a cool idea if you make it about this watershed and this like um giant you know like organism green organism like coming to life in the in the middle of the city how do you balance that with parks that sometimes a really nice park can displace residents now this is like with the highline phenomenon right so you're seeing like how much of a too much of a good thing is is uh, you know gonna really like change the fabric of a neighborhood so much that no one can live there except for rich people and like you know Z- I, I was gonna say Zaha Hadid though I was thinking about RIP she, <laughs> but like you know another Frank Gehry yeah, like apartment yeah. building right so how how do we make sure we balance that and um, create those opportunities but also not turn it into this you know the high it's line a tough this, question. it's almost like you know maybe you just need to fix it so it's it's good without making it an attraction that's one right. thing that comes up all the time it's just like give us the basic repairs to say our sidewalks and you know add, just add trees but not too many yeah. you know this becomes this amazing right. conversation that you would never think that we would be having you know in 2019 where people are worried that basic amenities are make a neighborhood like attractive to a developer and that's like frightening which is awful right (laughs) it's like so awful well i think also but the the aesthetic value the spectacle value and all those other things is a way is a way to get funding it's a way to make sure it happens of course yeah Uh, so uh, on that note i was wondering um because i think there are a lot of more realistic uh basic amenity things that need to have to improve neighborhoods, right? Um, do you find that in the articles you'd write or the researching and, and et cetera, et cetera, that uh, much of your time is spent trying to think about how to frame this or package it in a way that is appealing to kind of create that, that more seductive or appealing ambiance to sell more basic fundamental things. They might, you know what I mean? It's kind of. I think it, I'm just going to keep hitting my like sidewalk thing. I mean, it, it is like just a, a walkable shaded street is like what most people want even if you only drive or you know it's like such a basic thing but we just don't have it in this city so mm-hmm. it's like um, you can you could do a lot of other things that would make some people happy but I think like across I think across the board um, people just want like green you know right. and I think like that in the city their mayor said he's going to plant like 90,000 trees over the next two years or something and neighbor focusing on neighborhoods that need it most there are neighborhoods where houses and housing went in and no trees were planted by the city at all due to budgetary requirements and you know all other uh, you know goes back decades like all the problems that we've had in the city uh, when it comes to like forestation or forestation so just put the trees in. <laughs> Start with that. But you know, the, um, but I, guess, I guess the funny thing is, um, specifically with trees, I was actually on a city council meeting for uh, San Luis Obispo. This was years ago, and uh, someone had someone I know who's who's very intelligent and taught urban design, got up and spoke to the council in front of everyone and, and advocated for trees. And it was so interesting to hear because one, this is a thing that most urbanists understand is important. But it was almost like to the council and to a lot of people, it was almost too generic. It was like too boring. Yeah. You know, it's like trees. Why, why is this? He was he's older, which didn't help his case. Why is this old guy talking about trees to us? Like when we could talk about more interesting or more seductive or more. Yeah. Um, again, like tech solutions. Tech or solutions or, yeah. or just stuff that's more <laughs> shock value interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. And so for me, I'm always wondering, like, even though we know trees and wider sidewalks are are the the first thing that we have to do, is there a way to kind of sell them in a certain manner to make it 
as interesting as the, the more glamorous stuff. You know, like yeah, branding it's a weird... trees. I mean, trees are, are have like a public health investment factor that, and a cool urban cooling factor that have not really been. We need to mar maybe we need like a campaign for actual like <laughs> benefits of trees. Both sides they look cool, but it's like um, really this idea that cities can save money, both public, you know, in a public health way of like preventing illness and disease and mental illness even they're saying now mm. to like actually like cooling a building you know planting a tree and having it like shade your building enough that you don't have to crank the ac you know people know this who live in these certain neighborhoods like they're probably the the wealthier neighborhoods that have more trees are probably spending less on their air conditioning than a completely deforested uh you know neighborhood where it's a lot of people are living in apartment buildings it's crazy so we we really have to look at like maybe we need to put signs all over the trees in la that it's like this tree is saving the city like twenty thousand dollars and it is like that big of an amount sometimes like mm. when it comes to water and cooling and all these other things so these are like investments that we should be making you know it should be it should like there there were these like million trees campaigns right like you're talking about new york city and there was one here too and then they didn't build they didn't plant enough trees in la but i guess in some other places they did and you can tell the difference mm -hmm. when you walk so sacramento is a great example of like you know not a new york place the person who proposed they have like the i think they have the most trees per capita or you know um not the exact way of measuring it, but like they have, they have the best one of the best urban canopies like in the country, and they have um, like the most trees maybe per square foot or square acre or something like that, um, and very mature trees that are very well taken care of. And the idea to plant more trees was like a utilities guy, a guy that worked at the utilities company, that was like, oh, I just measured like on this street, and it's like where these people are spending less money on, you know, their cooling so we could like save the whole city a bunch of money. And they're like, okay, great, move forward with that plan. <laughs> and that was, that was not even that long ago yeah, yeah. and they did it. And there's so many other benefits that have been studied in like a place like Sacramento and including getting people to walk around and bike because it's 90 degrees there, but you don't feel it because the streets are so shaded. Right, right, right. Well, and I feel like, you know, like all of the European cities, like people love them. And they love them because they look beautiful. And why do they look beautiful? Because they have big giant trees. Yeah. Or even the cute streets in Brooklyn with the townhouses, they're cute because there is big trees, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm. Just put trees down the middle of every street and do bike lanes on either side, like your set. Like, <laughs> there's like not, it's not like we don't have room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But New York does that. I think it's, um, according to the street frontage of your building, you're required to provide a tree for every, I don't know, 10 feet or so. And if you don't, you have to pay for the tree you're not planting. And then they also had some grant that I think the DEP was giving for green roofs. So if you could show like how much water your green roof could retain, you know, from the storm water runoff, then you would get a grant from the DEP to get it built. So, you know, like, we have all that here and nobody knows about any of those things. Oh, God. Really? It, you get free trees. You can get like six free trees if you want to. You just call in a number and they'll give you free trees. But nobody knows about any of this. Oh, they will now. <laughs> yeah, they will now. <laughs> um, fix your, I don't know why your mic's been so We usually have th uh, three of those. I'm an idiot. I left the clamps at, at her place. So we just have these, <laughs> these things. Um, no, simple question. What's your favorite city? Well, Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Right? okay. What's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> that's the dumb question. <laughs> What's your favorite city outside of LA? Oh, that's such a tough one. Um, yes. It's always like the place I went to last. So okay. um, I went for the second time to Mexico City, mm -hmm. which is a great example of. First of all, walk first planning. They've pedestrianized a ton of their streets in downtown. They too have, I, when people like to draw parallels between cities, they don't like any city that like you try to compare LA to because they're always like, well, it's not like New York. It's not like <laughs> Copenhagen. It'll never be like San Francisco. But we do have a lot of similarities when you compare us to Mexico City. Really? Basically this megalopolis, right? It's like a giant metropolitan area. A lot of pollution, a lot of cars, um, spent money on things like trains and buses, but some of them are stuck in traffic or, you know, don't, a lot of people don't feel safe riding the subway in Mexico, Mexico City. So you've got, and a lot of housing issues and displacement problems as well. So what they've done is they've really just gone like kind of neighborhood by neighborhood and and decided like oh these streets are going to be pedestrianized and you think of like a place like mexico city where you know you think of these maybe beautiful tree-lined streets that have um these 
paths down the middle. You're walking through some of these neighborhoods. The trees are amazing, and the there's tra- rows of traffic going on either side of you. And down the middle, there's a walking trail that has more shade and is more accommodating. And there's still sidewalks on either side. Um, and then what they've done as far as their like biking and micro mobility, they've put in. Their scooters and bikes, their bike share is super successful. They have an open streets event every Sunday that cuts through like the main parts of the downtown. So every single Sunday, the streets are closed um, to walking and biking in, in certain areas, and which has made a tremendous difference in like in, envisioning a lot of these permanent changes. Mm-hmm. And some of their bike lanes are just literally like just those little curbs you see in parking lots, like a little cement curb just stuck on the street but that's enough to keep people safe and keep drivers aware of what's going on they just did it very quickly so there are great protected bike lanes and there are a lot of protected bus lanes but they're they're you know separated from traffic in these very affordable you know very fast way of, of making changes on the street so i think they've done a lot in a really short amount of time um there's a lot of other bigger changes when it comes to like smog and you go to you fly into mexico city in the the haze that you kind of like dip under is very, you know, still a huge problem. But they've made a lot of these neighborhoods very walkable, very welcoming, probably in a way that is, you know, causing displacement and um, and, and worries about gentrification in a lot of these places. But um, a lot of these families are healthier and a lot of the people that live there are, you know, have a better lifestyle because they can get around on bike share and, and dedicated bus lanes. So I've been... Very inspired, and the food is amazing too. But, yeah, I've been very inspired going around Mexico without car, Mexico City without cars. It's been exciting. Um, what do you think your your secret is to to walking around the city and being so observant? Mm. Good question. I think yeah. <laughs> an accurate and update prescription. Yeah, which I need. Um, I think it's not. It's trying not to pay too much attention and um, get it a little lost and um, try not to know where you're going and be easily um, uh, distracted by something else that you see. Um, and my kids are very good at this now <laughs> where we're going somewhere, we're walking and you know they'll point things out or see things or they'll want to go down different streets and I just say, okay, like let's go. You know, or they see a bus and I'm like, great, let's get on that bus. I don't know where we're going, but like <laughs> let's go. Um, so we just have children take you around, I guess. But yeah, I think the most the most like valuable experiences I've had in cities are when you stop a lot, talk to people, you actually aren't going somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, prescriptive and then you just uh, fall into a cafe and have like an amazing dessert or a glass of wine you know it, you just never know so it's so basically <laughs> ignoring the A to B yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, turn off Google, Google Maps and... app yeah just well, we find that whenever we travel we, there's big destinations we want to see if, like if we go to Japan might not go there anytime soon again so there's significant icons but it's like the strategy we, we found at least in being tourist is uh, know that destination, but the route to get there we don't define. Mm-hmm. We just kind of meander around. We look, took her watch. Like, okay, we got half an hour. We got time. And okay, we're supposed to be there really soon. Okay, we should we should get there. Yeah. But um, I don't. It's, it is kind of weird the, the things you get exposed to by doing it that way. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're not even the most important pieces of architecture or the best places to eat. They want the best food. Right. It's not the top. Yeah. But it's still somehow just as meaningful. Yeah. 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 Well, on that note, this was uh, super interesting, and we greatly appreciate you coming out here to ask you all these uh, questions about cities and Thank things you. like this. And uh, if we get a chance in the future, we'll have you on again. Maybe I mean, we can talk about, I don't know, all the, I mean, there's an endless source can, of material yeah. to talk about, right? So we can find something. <laughs> We could talk about what you would write about if it wasn't urbanism. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this week's episode of The Midnight Charrette. And thanks to our guest, Alyssa Walker, and our supporters and sponsors, Nod, uh, Microsica, Cool Dude Microsica, and Graphisoft. We are on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Um, so if you watch the YouTube and you listen to this week's show, there's a few things I should say. First of all, <laughs> we, we have our own three mics that we always use. We weren't able to use it this time because I'm an idiot and forgot the clamps. Uh, and so we didn't have those mics. So Marina and I were mic'd up using these two mics that we'd never used before, and which is why the quality is kind of really sketchy and I kept bumping into my mic. Um, the second thing is that video is still fairly new to us and every time we record, we have to set up. 
and I, no, no one, I'm looking at you, told me that my face was, I look like a, like a stick of butter. I was so shiny. <laughs> and it's it, partly because, uh, I love that, butter. <laughs> <laughs> that morning I forgot the clamp. So I was in a, we were in a mass Excuses. panic. Excuses, you just have oily skin, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a mass panic. So I had to run to a store to get clamps. They didn't have clamps to come back, use different mics. So it was, it was a whole catastrophe. Um, but we managed to, to, to do three separate recordings. Uh, one of them was with Alyssa. Uh, nonetheless, she was a fantastic guest. And I think her information was really, really quite tremendous, despite the shiny forehead and terrible uh, mic usage that we had. They were actually really good mics, but we just don't had to know how to use them properly. Anyway. Did, did you say there so, was three things? What three things? Three things that went wrong? No, I said there was three recordings that we did that day. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, what else? We have a website. It is midnightshawrette.com. So we are at uh, episode 113 at this point, and all of our episodes are on that website. If you like what we're doing, then please leave us a review in the podcast app. That would be super appreciated because those matter. And send us some donation on our website. Send I us mean, donations. Nah, why yeah. not? <laughs> and you can, don you can donate any amount you want. It could be 25 cents, 50 cents. Uh, but we have, you know, recommended amounts on there. I think it's like five. 10 20 and then 10 grand if you want to be a guest you can just donate 10 grand and we'll let you be a guest um and i think that's it for now right yeah that's all all right thanks for listening and we will talk to you again soon bye bye, -bye.